Hi, I'm Vaughn. I'm Claire. This is Deconstructing IoT, the series where we build applications, break down concepts, and interview experts at the forefront of the Internet of Things. Today we're excited to bring you along in our conversation with Tom Igo. Tom is professor at NYU's Interactive Telecommunications Program, co-founder of Arduino, author of several O'Reilly books, including Making Things Talk, and expert on connected devices. We'll ask Tom about the future of IoT, IoT's biggest challenges, and why there might be a better name than the Internet of Things. You've been vocal about the inadequacies of the term Internet of Things, and it's a catch-all phrase that's used so often in the media that we often forget to consider the origin and the meaning. I thought we would ask you to tell us why it might be lacking. Sure. Well, Kevin Ashton came up with the term Internet of Things. Uh, in, he claims to have come up with it in about 1999 when he was doing research at MIT on uh, RFID and looking for new applications of, of RFID. And he wrote a short essay in 2009 describing um, his original presentation on it from 99. And in that essay, basically what he describes is a couple of points. First of all, he says that all of the data up till that point on the internet had been entered by humans. And, uh, the, so the entire internet and computers were reliant on humans to enter data because all they had were keyboards. Second of all, he says humans are lousy at entering data or at capturing data thoroughly because we've got limited time and attention. Uh, then he proposes that we need to really give computers their own ways of automatically capturing data and capturing data fully. Um, and so basically what he's proposing in the Internet of Things is an internet without people. Um, and to me, that's kind of flawed. Now, you can take what he's doing and expand it to say all of that sensing and data is in the service of people, but in the original presentation, it really presents as an Internet that is literally about the things that are capturing the data. Um, so to me, that's just fundamentally flawed. So right now we see a lot of applications presented in the media as if they're ready for mass consumption, but really it seems only at the enterprise level right now that we see IoT applications that have been deployed and that are getting more sophisticated, while at the consumer level it seems like we're mostly seeing novelty applications and applications that just aren't quite feasible yet. Do you sort of see these as continuing on separate tracks, this sort of consumer space for IoT and enterprise space for IoT, or do you see them converging soon? I think ultimately they're going to have to converge um, because the industrial internet stuff where you're looking at, say, power monitoring for uh, a large business or even a small business like we have here at ITP or um, building management systems, uh, things like that, um, are, tend to be fairly standardized in their interfaces uh, and tend to be, uh, as you said, much more mature. But they're also really designed with maybe a small handful of manipulating users in, uh, in mind with a large number of users who never in, interact with the system themselves. So I think ultimately, uh, yes, they will need to merge and we'll need some common protocols across both because there are going to be times when you need to use commercial devices to access, excuse me, when you need consumer devices to access uh, commercial systems and vice versa. Mm -hmm. Speaking of common protocols, it seems like there are some technical barriers and um, logistical challenges for developing for the IoT. What are some of the challenges that you see developers and designers facing today? The biggest challenge I see is that most designers, uh, most user experience designers and user interface designers have been trained to design on screens only. They're not trained like industrial designers. Industrial designers are trained to think about appliances, to think about the simple controls and about giving users immediate feedback as to whether or not the thing is working or not. We have no good mental models for how network devices are working. And I think until we have that, um, designers and developers are really going to struggle in this space. I think many software developers tend to come at the problem entirely from a functional point of view rather than from a user-centered point of view. And as a result, they make things that you understand only if you understand the programming behind them. Aside from the design challenges, there are also challenges of, of course, um, security, privacy, um, potentially fail-safes for outages, power, or internet connectivity, especially in the case where lives depend in um, hospital contexts or, or such. 
do you see solutions being proposed for those kinds of challenges as well? I think there are solutions for those, definitely. I mean, when it comes to power outages or connectivity outages, I think uh, we're st we, particularly in the industrial internet space, it's common that you design the device so that there is minimum local functionality. That, you know, if the lights need to go on, you can turn on a light switch, for example. Um, we're not seeing that as much in the consumer space yet, and we need to. Um, in terms of connectivity, I don't think we're seeing uh, as good a uh, job done on that side as we need to. As I say, it's being done well in the industrial space because it's being designed for experienced users um, who can manipulate different types of networks. Uh, but in the consumer space, it's really making the assumption that you are living at home, you have a home wireless router, you have total control over that wireless router, and you can access all the devices on it. And even though that is the case for many users, many of them don't understand that as thoroughly as they need to to use the kind of product we're talking about. So through your work with Arduino, you've had the unique position of quite literally shaping the future of connected devices. How have the technical challenges changed over the last 10 to 15 years, and do you think we're just still attacking the same problems now? I don't think we're necessarily tackling the same problems. There have been some changes. Mm -hmm. um, we are repeating some things, yes, but the big change is obviously Wi-Fi is one of them. Um, you know, when I started doing this, you didn't see Wi-Fi as a standard way of doing things. It was wired Ethernet, period. Mm -hmm. um, there was not as much of an understanding of how, uh, a popular understanding of how networks work. There weren't as many people who had a home network. Uh, we didn't have Bluetooth, uh, which has been a big change in the space. Um, so all those three things have definitely contributed to the change. Um, and we obviously didn't have uh, handheld devices when I started doing this either. So the idea that a person might have three or four connected devices is now commonplace. It wasn't when I started. So we're making some progress there. Um, we're still not quite at a point where people understand that they might have a personal network or that they have a ne personal network to manage. Um, I think we're better at it than we were uh, certainly when I started this, but we still got some room to go in that space. In terms of the applications, I think we haven't really seen yet um, the end of the first round of, of personal applications in this space. You know, there have been most of the applications we've seen over this time um, were honestly desktop or screen, uh, a tablet type applications. You know, I actually stopped teaching my networked objects class in 2009. I'd started in 2002. I stopped it because there were no connected devices. Uh, and I took a break for a few years. Mm -hmm. And it's only la in the last couple of years that I decided, okay, we're starting to see enough industrial design in this space that it's worth teaching again. Um, I'm seeing many of the same ideas pop up again that had popped up in research labs back then. Uh, and that's perhaps a sign that we didn't ever get to realize those ideas as thoroughly as we wanted to, and now we're only just beginning to. Mm -hmm. You touched upon this in a previous question, but um, it seems like the more ubiquitous a technology becomes, the more far removed we are from how it works, or the general population is from how it works. What do you think that younger generations' relationship to and understanding of connected devices will be in the future? Are we moving more and more towards um, early school curriculum that requires an understanding of networks and learning programming? I don't think, well, hmm, that's a tough question. So I don't think we necessarily have to understand programming to understand networks. Uh, I think. And I think the question, I'd, I'd reverse a little bit. I'd say that as technologies become more ubiquitous and, and enter um, everyday life, we don't become more and more remote from their operation. We gain a clear mental model of how they operate, even if we don't understand the actual operation. If you think about cars, for example, we all have a pretty clear mental model of how they operate, even if we can't fix the engine. And the car industry has gotten good at delivering that mental model to us so that it's consistent, it's predictable, and the car does what we think it should. I think we need to get that way with networks, too. Even if people don't have a thorough understanding of what's going on under the hood, the kinds of uh, connectivity problems we have now, the kinds of uh, indications of what's going on um, aren't there yet, and we need to clear that up. Um, so if we get to a point where we've got a predictable mental model that everybody shares, we'll be much better off. Now, we will need some basic uh, network literacy. We'll need to understand 
what a client and a server is. We'll need to understand what a home connector or a hub or a router, whatever you want to call it, is. Um, and I think we will see a rise in programming literacy as well, but I don't think that will have to be ubiquitous in order the devices to be ubiquitous. So for the mental model, is that something that evolves and comes about naturally, or is that something that is almost taught? Um, I think it's something that's learned culturally. You know, if you think about the way uh, we learn social media now, right? Um, I think one of the reasons kids tend to learn it faster than adults is they're often in situations where uh, they've got a larger uh, group around them that's receptive to it and more time to experiment. Do they understand it at a, at a highly technological level? Not necessarily, no. Do they understand it at a very good functional level? Absolutely. And I think we can get the same way with devices. Well, if there is a shift in, in people learning about electronics, your work with Arduino has certainly been a part of that. And I'm wondering what you think the most sophisticated or some of the most sophisticated connected device applications are that you've seen come out of the Arduino community from Arduino users. Well, um, among the Arduino community, uh, I've seen a lot of really interesting applications around monitoring. I've seen some earthquake monitoring stuff. There was a great project in South America by an 11-year-old boy building an earthquake monitor that was amazing. Uh, there's some, been some really good crowdsourced radiation monitoring projects after the Fukushima disaster. Um, there's been a number of really nice uh, musical instrument projects, not necessarily connected, but it's something that comes up a lot in the Arduino community. Um, and I think perhaps those are some of the, my favorite projects. Um, the level of sophistication people have uh, around uh, the behavior of the person performing the musical instrument is, is really great to see. Because I think ultimately that's a level of sophistication that really matters. Um, again, even if you only understand the technology at a rudimentary level, if you can make it do what you need it to do predictably and repeatedly, you win. So Tom, looking ahead, you know, five to ten years into the future, what's a major impact you think we'll see from the Internet of Things, both in terms of day-to-day -day lives and in terms of systems that will be supporting connected devices? I think we're going to see a couple things happen. First mm -hmm. off, uh, we're going to see the device equivalent of the blue screen of death. We're going to have situations where we can't turn on the lights in our house yeah. or we can't turn on the heat mm -hmm. because our system's down. And I hope we don't see that widespread, but I think we'll see it enough that manufacturers will go, oh, we need to build in redundancy. We need to build in better, more industrial control, right? So I think that's a biggie. Mm -hmm. I think the other we're already seeing, which is we're seeing security uh, lapses all over the place. Um, you know, we're seeing all kinds of uh, identity fraud. We're seeing things like the Sony hack. We're seeing all these cases where um, people are breaking into systems, and that is, that's not an anomaly. That is one of the fundamental uh, characteristics of a network, that they are vulnerable, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think what we're going to have to see is a better understanding of security and encryption, and I think we're going to have to see better use of it in um, consumer uh, devices and, and interfaces. I think, back to the question of what the popular understanding will be, I think we'll get to a point where uh, everyday users may not understand how encryption works, but they'll know that it works, and they'll know that they need to apply it. And ideally, they'll know when they're using it and when they're not. What do you think are the most valuable and powerful hardware and software tools out there right now for shaping the future of, of IoT? I hope Arduino is one of them. Um, <laughs> I, think, uh, I think the kinds of... Uh, Connector APIs like Tembu provides is certainly one of them. Mm -hmm. I think the idea of an API in general is huge. And um, if every service that's out there doesn't have uh, at least a partial public-facing API by the end of uh, the decade, I'd be very surprised. Mm -hmm. um, so those are uh, probably uh, three of the biggies to mm -hmm. me. Um, I think we will uh, we'll see more and more uh, easy to configure Wi-Fi and Bluetooth uh, tools. I think we'll start to see, well, we're already starting to see in the Bluetooth space devices that 
you can configure without programming and build applications on top of. I think we'll see the same thing in the Wi-Fi space um, because then you get to a point where your UI and UX designers and your industrial designers can say, I can configure the behavior of this. This is the prototype. Go build it for me. Um, and uh, under that, I think there's a lot of technologies that people don't even notice that are really uh, profound and important. HTTP, I think uh, it's everywhere, and it's going to be even more everywhere. Um, I think we're going to get to a point where devices are speaking to each other universally or uniformly in, in URLs or URIs uh, to exchange services, to exchange capabilities, and to exchange warnings. Um, and uh, when we get to a point where that is a common standard among devices, then they become much more interoperable. Then we start to see an industry that can really take off. This is a kind of related, but probably a pretty tough question. Um, is there an IoT application, either conceptual or fully realized, that you think has a real potential to impact the future in a pretty positive way? That is a tough question. There are probably several. Uh, I guess one that I would like to see is I'd like to see some really good work done on connected assistive devices. So um, if you think, for example, about what's the change that we're seeing in the prosthetics market as a result of the last you know, umpteen wars we've been in the Middle East, right? We're seeing more kids come back without limbs. So as a result, we're seeing some real advances in prosthetics. It's not a great way to get it, but we're getting it. Um, we're also seeing a lot of DIY prosthetics. Um, I think we're going to see more and more instances of prosthetics that have, say, a tablet interface or a phone interface, so you can, you can get a sense of whether they're ill-fitting, you can do minor adjustments, that kind of thing, and you can even uh, customize them a little bit. Uh, I think we'll see the same thing with other assistive devices, everything from hearing aids to uh, glasses to you, know, you name it there. Um, I don't mean Google glasses, I mean regular glasses. Um, and I, I hope we'll start to see some of that in the medical space in general, because if you think about it, the largest generation we've got right now and most prosperous are the baby boomers. And they're getting old. And they got money to burn. So if I were a 20-something right now trying to figure out how to make a million dollars, I would be looking at geriatrics. Um, and I'd be looking at connected geriatrics, because having the ability to... Um, to monitor, to customize, and to make comfortable is going to be huge in that space. Thanks so much for having us uh, over to your space, Tom. It's been a really uh, insightful conversation and one that I know all of our viewers and users at Timbu will, will really enjoy. Um, if any of our users have uh, follow-up questions for Tom or other IoT-related questions that you'd like us to explore, send us a note anytime at hey at timbu.com. Thanks so much. Thank you.